So classifying numbers is actually something that you've been doing for many, many years. It's just you're now starting to get to the age where we're really becoming more sophisticated and we're going to use it more and you're going to be asked random questions about it and you need to know how to answer them and how they work. So as we look at this, um, I'm going to just first start talking about a Venn diagram. I know you've done them, but we have to make sure you understand um, how this is set up. Now, if we look at this, um, we have this Polk County. So this is just in general, okay? I've got all of this stuff right here. This whole entire box here is considered to be the universe. And in this case, the universe is Polk County, which is kind of silly, but okay. So Polk County, we're talking about everybody in Polk County. Everybody in Polk County fits within this box right here, okay? Then as we start breaking it down, we've got in this box right here, we've got all Winnie Mac students. Okay, in this box over here, we've got other school district students. So um, let's say, you know, you, you are a Winnie Mac student, right? So you belong in that box right there. But, um, you know, I wasn't a Winnie Mac student. I was from Faustin. Don't hold it against me. So um, I belong in that other box there. But let's talk more specifically. You'll also notice that in here, I also have this circle right here. Now this circle is contained within this box. So that means anything that belongs in here is also in here, which would make sense that you belong in that circle. Oh, see, now they're gonna be mean to me. I'm gonna cross off the you there and I'm gonna put you here. Right, because sp more specifically than just being a Winnie Mac student, you are an 11th grade student. So technically, you belong in this circle because you are 11th grade, but you are also a Winnie Mac student. Okay, and we can go even farther and say, you know what, you're in my Algebra 2 class. You also belong here. So I need to cross you off here, and I need to put you here because you want to be as specific as possible. You are in a, the Algebra 2 class, so you belong there. The 11th grade is just outside, and then a Winnie Mac student. So you are in all of it. Whoever's right here is also in the 11th grade, is also in the Winnie Mac student. Now, who could we put out here that isn't supposed to be in here. So if you can think of any 11th grader that's not in Algebra 2, I don't, I can't think of any, and of course, from year to year, this will change. But someone who may be not in Algebra 2, for whatever weird reason, would be out there. Maybe they've already taken Algebra 2, and now they're um, taking a senior class instead of that. They would belong here. And then, um, anybody out here, this would be your third grade students, right, or your 10th grade students, or your kindergartners, those belong out there because they're not in 11th grade, and they're definitely not in Algebra 2, so those would be out there, okay, so that's how a Venn diagram works. Now let's move to one that I really care about, which is the real numbers, okay, this is where math comes in, this is where we're going to talk about the types of numbers that you can have, Okay, so real numbers are all the numbers you can think of. Now, we're actually going to know about some numbers that are not real. They're called imaginary. We're going to learn about those later on this year, about Chapter 5. But for now, any number you can think of, and I don't care how clever you're going to be, any number you can think of is a real number. Okay, now, those real numbers are split into two classifications. We have the rational numbers, which are most of the numbers you can think of. So rational numbers are numbers where, let's say, you have a fraction or a decimal or whole number, negative numbers, positive numbers. Um, a lot of those are real numbers. Well, all of those are real numbers. Okay, whenever I think about a rational number, a lot of times in the higher level math, rational means fraction. Um, but even as a decimal, if you had 2.777777 and going on and on, that is also considered rational because you always know what number comes next, okay? So um, let's go 2.7 repeating. I know what's coming next. It's another 7. 2.5 is also rational. It's a decimal. One-third is rational, okay? Those are all rational numbers. Other rational numbers are whole numbers, but I'm not going to write them down. Well, yeah, I'll write them down. So... Just, just a two is rational. Um, zero is rational. Okay, those are also rational. Negative five is rational. We're going to talk about why I put them in green. We're going to move them in a little bit. Okay, but before I do that, I want to talk about irrational numbers. Now, irrational numbers are numbers where you cannot predict what number comes next. Okay, so um, an example would be pi. Okay, pi is irrational, and think about it, 3.14159265358979323. Three. 
Okay, that's all I got. That's as far as I've memorized. Now, what number comes after that last three? Do you know? I don't know. Okay, we could look it up. But ultimately, pi goes on forever. It doesn't have a pattern. It doesn't repeat. That means it's irrational. So pi is irrational. So are square roots. The square root of 2 is irrational because if you plug that in a calculator, it's going to give you all these decimals with no pattern. But it's also, even though it stops on your calculator, it actually keeps on going forever. Square roots do that. But you have to be careful about that because if I had the square root of 4, that is going to be rational because if you simplify the square root of 4, you just get 2. And 2 is done. We know what comes next. Nothing comes next. So um, rational numbers, you know what comes next. Irrational numbers, you can't predict the next thing. And ultimately, if you want to think irrational, think pi and square roots that can't be simplified. Okay, let's go back to the rational numbers. Now, our rational numbers, right, we've got all these out here, the fractions, decimals, everything. And then we've got something called integers. Now, integers is a word we don't use a lot in the real world. Um, mainly, it's just in math class. But integers are your whole numbers. So you remember that 2? I need to put that in the integers. Okay, that 0 needs to be put in the integers. What else? The square root of 4 needs to be put in the integers. The negative 5 needs to be put in the integers. So those are all whole numbers. Integers don't have any fractions. They don't have any decimals. So your 2.7 repeating, the 2.5, the 1 -third, those have to stay out here. They don't go in the integers. Integers are just numbers that don't have a repeating. So we can add more. Um, we could add negative 3 and negative 2, and we have all kinds of numbers that are integers, okay? But more specifically, we can go down to the whole numbers. Now, a lot of people think of integers and whole numbers as being the same. The difference is with whole numbers, there's no negatives, whereas the integers include the negatives. So technically, this 0 needs to go here. The 2 needs to go here. Oops, that's supposed to be a 2. And the square root of 4 needs to go here because those are all whole numbers. They're not negative. They're positive numbers starting with 0. Okay, so really the only thing I'm going to see in this outside part of the circle are the negatives. But remember, anything in here is also included in here. So 0 is a whole number, 0 is an integer, and 0 is a rational number. Okay, so this is the Venn diagram. Hopefully you can answer some questions from that. Okay, now the other thing that we need to talk about in this lesson are properties. Okay. Now, properties, you've done properties many, many times over in elementary and high school, middle school. Um, we have, let's just start with the commutative property. So the commutative property of addition would be, let's change colors here, I'm getting bored. Okay, commutative property of addition would be if you take two numbers that are real and you add them together, okay, so we've added those. It's the same as if you change the order. Commutative means you can change the order of anything and it'll be the same answer. Okay, so commute means to move. So we move our numbers, we get the same answer. Multiplication, same thing. Two times three is the same thing as three times two. Okay, so we get the same answer. Um, so it's commutative. Associative means if I was adding three numbers together, I would get the same thing. So remember what this means. Um, adding with parentheses here means I have to add these first and then add that. But with the associative rule says I can move the parentheses and I'm still going to get the same thing. So if I were to add these two first and then that, that would be okay. Now you use this a lot actually in your head. Um, if you think about, you know, let's say you're adding um, something that's $1.75 and adding something that's $4.50. Okay, you're adding those together, at least I do this a lot. I'll add these two together, and then I'll add these two together. Um, so this is the commutative, pro or the associative property. We can add things in different orders, um, at which ones you add first are different, and, um, and you can still get the same answer. The same thing goes for multiplying. If I was to multiply like this, so three and four first, and then times two, it'd be the same thing as if I took two times three, and then times the four, I would get the same thing. So associative is where you move the parentheses. Okay, identity is where it keeps its identity. So what can you add to two so that it's still two? And basically the idea is if you add zero, you'll still get two. So that's the identity. And the inverse is saying what could you add to two so that you get to the identity of zero? So then we would say negative 2. So that's the inverse property, is that what do you add so you get back to 0? For multiplication, it says, what do you multiply times 2 so that you keep its identity? That would be a 1. 
And the inverse is, what do you multiply times 2 so you get back to that identity of 1? And that would be the reciprocal, 1 half. Okay, now closure is just kind of a weird thing. It took me a while to really understand it when I was in college. Of course, I didn't see it in high school. We moved things down a little bit, didn't we? But um, closure is saying, if I take two real numbers and add them together, it is still a real number. Okay? If I take two, oh, I added wrong, didn't I? Why didn't you stop me? Okay, so then that's a five. If I take two real numbers and multiply them, it's still a real number. So the fact that it's still real makes it, um, it, ha it has closure. And that doesn't really make sense to you at this point because w you don't know anything other than real numbers. So of course anything you add together and multiply together will give you something real. And so if you, you know, make it to the end of this course, you'll find out that there's imaginary numbers. And if you add imaginary and imaginary, it's still imaginary. But if you multiply to imaginary, it might be real. And so it's not closed. Because the idea is closed means it can live in its own world and it never leaves that world. So if we go back up here, okay, anything in here being added or multiplied is going to still be in here. So if it wasn't closed, it would mean if you took something here and here and multiplied them and it ended up being outside your universe, then it's not closed. It's not closed within its own universe. So that's something you don't really use. I'm just hoping maybe some of you grasped it because it's kind of a cool thing. And then there's the distributive property. And the distributive property says um, if you have a multiplication on the outside and addition on the inside like this, you can take and multiply both of those separately. So 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4. You can multiply those separately and get the same answer. So you could just go ahead and add and get 14. Or if you multiply them separately, you would still get 14. So it doesn't matter which way you use it, it'll still get the same answer, which is useful for us here in this, um, in this class because we're going to have to do this and distribute it quite a bit. Okay? Now, you'll notice that up here, I only did addition and multiplication. So a lot of times the question is, or maybe hopefully you're thinking about it, is what about subtraction and division? And unfortunately, subtraction and division do not work. We do not have the commutative property. We do not have the associative property for subtraction, subtraction and division. Um, so you just you know, only use these properties when you're doing addition and multiplication.